All right, we're here today for the Veterans History Project interview with First Lieutenant Dwayne Grounds. He was a P-51 pilot in the 376th Fighter Squadron, 361st Fighter Group of the 8th Air Force. He was based in Little Walden, England before moving over to Belgium for several missions and then eventually back to Little Walden, England. So I guess I'll start and ask you, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was a senior in high school at Hooker, Oklahoma, uh, and I recall they let us listen on the radio to President Roosevelt's famous speech where he described the day that will live in infamy. And uh, of course, uh, we were all very concerned. Uh, when I graduated from high school in May of 1942, I, I enrolled then at uh, Oklahoma University in Norman, and I enrolled as a pre-law student. And my advisor thought I was crazy because I insisted that I was going to take physics. I wanted college algebra because I knew even at that point that I was going to enlist and I wanted to be a an aviation cadet. I was at OU for about three months and I persuaded my parents to allow me to go take the test for aviation cadet pr program. Uh, I passed both the physical and the uh, written tests and was sworn in on November the 11th of 1942. They told me, go on home, we'll call you. They didn't call me up to active duty until January of 1943. I went, went to basic training at Shepherd Field in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. Mm -hmm. And from there I went to uh, San Marcos, Texas for what they called College Training Detachment was supposed to be there for three months. In the first month they took all of the college graduates and said we're going to send you to Classification Center but they had some open slots and because I made such good grades in physics <laughs> and math I went out with that first group uh, to go to Classification Center. Uh, while I was at San Marcos, they gave us 10 hours of flying instruction in, in Aeronicus. I never really felt like I was flying that airplane. It always seemed to me it was just ready to fall out from under me. And I was, frankly, scared to death. And when I took my check ride, the old fella who, who uh, gave me my check ride wrote in my logbook, student is too tense and erratic, do not recommend for further flight training. Out of loyalty to my father though, when I got to classification center, I put down my first choice as pilot training, then navigator, and then bombardier. Knowing full well that I had this logbook that said do not recommend for further flight training, uh, that I wouldn't be classified as a pilot. But I'll swear when the list came out, there I was on to go to pilot training. And I got hold of a second lieutenant and I said, yeah, but look at this logbook. Look at this logbook. He says it doesn't recommend me for further flight training. And his comment was, we don't give a damn what that civilian says. We'll find out whether or not you can fly. <laughs> so away I went to, uh, to primary in Sykeston, Missouri. And I fell in love with flying there. Uh, we were flying the PT-19, a Fairchild, uh, and uh, I soloed in eight hours and, and uh, did pretty well. And from there I went to uh, Winfield, Kansas to Strother Field for basic flying. And 
and uh, from there I went to Victoria, Texas for advanced uh, training at Aloe Field and that's where I graduated and got my wings and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Uh, took some gunnery at, uh, uh, at Matagorda Island uh, and did, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, fly the P-40 for 10 hours uh, before being transferred to Waycross, Georgia, where I did my fighter training in P-40s about almost 100 hours there. Um, in September, I was uh, went to New York, uh, where we boarded the Mauritania and uh, went across to England unescorted. Uh, did a lot of S-turns out there uh, <laughs> trying to throw off the submarines. But anyhow, landed in, in um, England in late September. Were there Jimmy encounters with any subs? Were there any scares? No. no. Uh, never had a scare. Uh, but uh, we landed at Liverpool and uh, went to an airfield uh, called Gox Hill where I took uh, 10 hours of uh, training in the P-51 because I had never flown a P-51 until I got overseas. Uh, I was then transferred to the 361st Fighter Group and assigned to the 376th Fighter Squadron. I flew and this, was, this was in November? But at that time, uh, yes, I flew. Uh, I flew. I think eight missions before part of the group was sent to uh, Saint Dizier, France, during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, either fortunately or unfortunately, I thought I I wanted to go to Saint Dizier with them, but I was not. Uh, they didn't take the whole group. They only took part of of the group uh, to Saint Dizier uh, for that. Uh, Battle of the Bulge uh, effort. The group then was moved from uh, Saint Dizier to Chevs, Belgium, and those of, who, of us who were still in England uh, moved to Chevs, Belgium also. Then I flew my first mission out of Belgium was on February the 8th, where uh, on that mission, well up until that mission I had never had the tape off of my guns and that's one of the things that the ground crew always looked at. Soon as you got within seeing distance of them they wanted to know if you had fired your guns. Well I hadn't, but I did fire them that day and uh, we, we spotted a Heinkel 111 down on the deck and we destroyed that sucker. Um, <laughs> Lieutenant Hobbs and I were given each a half credit for destroying that. Uh, that was later taken away from us and given to another, another pilot, um, <laughs> a matter of politics. But, but you were anyhow. a participant in, this, in yes. destroying that plane, yep. so that was... Yes, mm -hmm. I was a participant anyhow. Of uh, flying out of Belgium was much better than flying out of England because you didn't have to cross the North Sea. It seemed like my airplane engine always ran rough when we got out over the North Sea. Although <laughs> I never, I never aborted a mission because of that. Uh, My most memorable mission was, let me back up, most of our missions were escort missions, escorting B-17s, B-24s, uh, B-26s, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, four of us escorted uh, 
two P-38s on a photographic mission, one mission, but most of them were escorts of the heavy bombers. Uh, when you were based out of Belgium, did that enable you to escort the bombers further into their target or fully? Well, fully or? we could, we could, uh, the P-51 could go all the way to Berlin, even from uh, England, because we carried 105 gallon external wing tanks under each wing besides what we had internally. And so unless we had to drop tanks way early on a mission, we could escort the bombers all the way in and all the way out. Most of the times, even when we were escorting them, and as soon as we got the bombers out of harm's way, then we looked for targets of opportunity. Uh, strafing trains, uh, and airfields. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my most memorable mission was one on that I flew on April the 16th uh, and and the mission that time was to strafe uh, airfields uh, Kirsham and I can't remember the name anyway we were uh, we made a pass on the uh, we spotted these uh, German airplanes back in the in the trees just off of the airfield and uh, I could not fire on my first pass but saw the airplanes and so I made a second pass but when I made my second pass I was firing on a Ju-52 and all of a sudden just off my left wing there was a ball of fire just rolling across the field that ball of fire turned out to be uh, a young pilot who was uh, just a wonderful guy, Delmer Ford from Kentucky, and uh, it seems that I was the only one who saw him because they listed him MIA for quite a while, even though I could verify that he was in that airplane off off my left. Well, there's more to that story. Delmer Ford and I both graduated in the same class. Uh, at Aloe Field, and his his uh, serial number was zero seven two zero eight two nine. I was a that little farther down in the alphabet. My serial number was zero seven two zero eight four one. My dog tags that I have here has my name. Delmer Ford's serial number on them. Hmm. Sounds like a, a Paul Harvey hears the rest <laughs> of the story, but sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to grab those and put them in front of the camera here. There you can see, you can get to focus. It says Dwayne Grounds. It has your serial number 0720829 let's say 7 or no T42430 I think that's tetanus uh, has something to do with my So you have number. his serial number I have his serial number on my dog tags and I never did notice that until probably four or five years ago when I was looking through some of my stuff. One of the other things is uh, I have a little piece of uh, shrapnel that my crew chief dug out of my bomb rack from this mission uh, where we were straight from the airfield on the 16th of April. Okay, so you have, so you have the shrapnel there. Here's a piece of shrapnel that my crew chief dug out of the, my bomb rack uh, as a souvenir from the April 16th mission. And that was the same mission where your friend it, was yes. listed missing action. Yep. And uh, it looks to me like this is probably about a 20 caliber uh, piece of shrapnel. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's uh, compliments of the Germans <laughs> who were guarding the airfield.
on April the 17th of 1945. Uh, so that was the next day, is that right? You yeah. said April 16th was... Yes. Okay. But my last mission, uh, they pretty well shut us down. One of the interesting things at every, almost every briefing in the late stages of the war, I'm going to say March and April of 45, one of the things they would say to us was, be careful guys, be on the lookout because we don't know where Patton is today. <laughs> he was one of my heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you stopped on April the 17th. 17th. And how many missions had you flown at that point? At that point I had flown 40 missions. That's about half of a tour for a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I was young and enthusiastic and not married, no ties, I volunteered to go to the South Pacific. And as a matter of fact, uh, a number of us who had volunteered, we already had our uh, all of our baggage and our uh, foot lockers, everything was stenciled to, to go through the states and then to, to the South Pacific. But before we left, it could leave England, the uh, war in the Pacific was also over. So uh, we started uh, then to uh, all of the airplanes that had over a hundred combat hours were scrapped. And so I flew uh, a P-51 to Manchester where <laughs> they were waiting uh, to salvage that thing with almost before I got out of the airplane. But on the way up there I had a, I had a screwdriver and so I took the uh, clock out of that airplane, and I still have that today. <laughs> and that's the clock out of a P-51D. And it ran for years and years, but evidently the oil in there has so congealed that it will no longer run. And I've had it to two or three different people trying who are who are supposedly watchmakers, but nobody can figure out how to get inside that airplane, that uh, clock. So is it a wind-up clock? It's a wind-up, eight-day clock. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty neat. After the war, war then I was uh, sent to uh, Germany in the Army of Occupation. If I had gotten credit for uh, that half of the German Heinz 11, I would have been a, I would have had enough points to come home. Mm. But without that, I didn't have enough. So they they sent a lot of us went to uh, uh, to the Army of Occupation. I was stationed at Darmstadt, Germany, uh, and I was the assistant supply officer. Well, I could see the writing on the wall that was apparent that I wasn't going to get to be just a fighter pilot. They wanted me to do some kind of ground duty, and I, I had no interest in that. And so uh, as soon as, uh, as I was eligible, I uh, came home from uh, overseas, left Antwerp, Belgium, in February, spent 29 days on a Liberty ship coming home. We were supposed to come into New York and we were about one or two days out of New York and they changed the orders and said we were going to New Orleans. So we turned south, pulled into Miami to refuel, wouldn't let us off of the ship pulled out of there and went around uh, Florida and, and pulled into uh, New Orleans. What were the conditions like on the ship? Was it overcrowded at all? Or it, was it was 
a mess mm. because at that time of the year in the Atlantic it was pretty rough seas and this, there were a lot of guys that got seasick fortunately I never did get seasick but some of them were terribly seasick and it was not it wasn't a pleasant uh, return home but anyway got into New Orleans and then I went to Fort Leavenworth where I was separated from the service but I did stay in the reserves uh, until 1956 and as a matter of fact I, during the Korean affair I hoped that they would call me back but they never did. My wife thought I was crazy because here I was married with a, with a baby at that time so Anyway, so after your after your last mission on April seventeenth, and, and then you were in the Army of Occupation, did you fly anymore on your own after that? Oh, I've, a little. Yep, I got four hours of flying time uh, in a uh, L four or an L five. <laughs> not quite a P fifty one. No, <laughs> to me it was not like flying. It was it wasn't anything that I enjoyed. I can tell you, because mm -hmm. I really. Love to fly the P-51. It was a wonderful airplane. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful airplane. And as a matter of fact, while I stayed in the reserves, uh, I would drive from Hooker, Oklahoma, to Oklahoma City to Tinker to get in uh, once a month to get in four four hours of flying time. Uh, and I did get to fly a P-51 out of there. The last time I flew one, my air, my uh, radio caught on fire as I was taken off, so I just circled the field and landed, and that was my last last chance to fly the P-51. So that was in what year was that that you last flew? That would have been in 1946 hmm. and 47. Mm -hmm. and. I couldn't, frankly, couldn't afford to make the trip anymore, so I went on inactive uh, status until 1956. And then I asked for and got my discharge. Mm -hmm. A couple questions I have for you. Um, you said you flew P-40s mm -hmm. early on, and then you moved to the P-51, obviously. Yeah. What were the difference in flight characteristics in flying the P-51 versus the P-40? I mean, how, how would you compare the two? Well, the P-40 was about 100 miles an hour slower. Uh, the old P-40 was a very stable aircraft. If you changed the airspeed five miles an hour, you had to retrim the air, aircraft. It was, uh, it was just obsolete, that's all. Uh, and. The P-51 was a was an unforgiving airplane if you jammed a throttle to it like you were coming in for a landing and wanted to uh, needed to go around. If you you weren't careful, the torque would overcome you, mm -hmm. and it'd flip you right over on your back. And that happened to a lot of guys. Uh, how how would that happen? So you're coming for landing, if you give it too much throttle, it would well or just roll you over, huh? Yeah. It usually happened if some if somebody was coming in, maybe they were too hot and were going to have to go around. So they would throw the power to it and it would, if you don't get on that rudder immediately, it would roll you right over on its back. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, my flight commander, we called him a German ace because he had destroyed five American air <laughs> fighter planes. <laughs> <laughs> and survived all of them, but he uh, he hit his head on the face on the gun sight on one of them and knocked a bone out of here. And he was always kind of gotcha eyed, he, and he still continued to fly. Now landing the P forty versus the P fifty one, the P forty had a lot narrower landing gear. Yes, than the P fifty one. Yep. Was that tricky? Tricky. Mm -hmm. Yep. Easy to ground tricky. loop then? Easy to kind of spin yep. around? Uh, matter of fact, when we 
when we graduated from flying school, we'd been flying the AT-6. And I've forgotten to tell you, my first trip in the P-40 after I had graduated, I got in that airplane and started it up and I looked out, out over it and the nose looked like it was a half a mile out there. <laughs> I carried that T-6. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my feet on the rudder pedals were do it going just like this. I mean just pat and pat, pat and pat and pat. And I was very tempted to turn around and go back to the revetment and say, here, now I there give were, up. Was it from the vibration of the plane, or you were no, just nervous? No, nervous, <laughs> just scared to death. And I said, I, I got to do this. I got to do it. And uh, part of part of the <laughs> part of the apprehension was because uh, I was scheduled to fly in the afternoon, but in the morning, every runway at Aloe Field had cracked up P forties sitting on the runway. So I wasn't the only one that was nervous, but I finally gave it the gun, got off, flew around for about an hour, came back in and landed, and after that it was okay because I knew, knew then I, I could do it. But I wasn't sure I could do it my first ride and that thing. You know, you don't get any dual uh, instruction when you start to fly fighters. Mm -hmm. You just read the book, the manual, make sure you know where all the instruments are, and you get in that sucker and you crank it up and you fly it. So what, was the P-51 easier to fly? Yeah. I mean, uh, when you went from P-40 to P-51, was it... Whew. Well... I was used to a long nose out there in front of me, and uh, the only the only bad feature when uh, when I took my first uh, flight in the P fifty one after we got to England, uh, Gox Hill. Nearly all of the airplanes that were up there were war weary airplanes that had been shuffled from fighter groups up to Gox Hill to the training. And the airplane that I drew, and, and I was flying in the late evening and, uh, la and landing and taking, taking off and landing right into the sun. Well, this old airplane that I was flying uh, was leaking oil like a sieve, I guess, because when I came back in to land, I could hardly see out the windscreen. I had to look out the side. And... Uh, I must have leveled off and uh, to land that thing some 30 or 40 feet in the air because it seemed to me like I dropped forever before uh, I hit the ground. But uh, I survived that one too, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't run the uh, wheel, the struts up through the wings. So, but it was sure a hard landing, mm -hmm. a hard landing. When you were on any of your missions, did you actually see any German planes in the air? Yes. No, I never saw. I was here again. That was pretty late in the war, so there yes. weren't as many of them around. I never flew a mission where I saw a ME-109 or an FW-190, but I did see a lot of ME-262s. Uh, I probably came... As close to getting shot down when I was chasing an a, a ME-262. We were cruising, we were tooling along, and I look up above us, and it looked like this jet is probably uh, another fifteen or twenty thousand feet above us. But I could tell the way he was coming down that he was out of fuel. And I just thought to myself, if I do a split S right here, I might meet him out at the bottom. And sure enough, when I pulled out at the bottom. There he was, probably 200 yards in front of me. And just as I started to trigger, I see these uh, tracers coming over the top of my canopy. And I had to wheel out of there. But the German pilot bailed out. I 
to this day I don't know who it was behind me that that uh, that got him, but uh, that's oh, so someone behind you, the tracers you saw were friendly tracers. Yes, yes. I, I but you yes. almost got shot down by your own yeah, guy. I, somebody <laughs> either in our own group or in some. But it was friendly fire. Well, I would think you should get partial credit because he probably saw two guys on his tail. He's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Listen, he was all decked out in a black leather flying suit. They were classy guys that yeah. flew those jets, I what, guess. what was your impression of the German pilots, even though you had a few cameras? Uh, what, what was your impression of them? They seemed to be about as inexperienced as I was because uh, on uh, one occasion, off my left wing, there's this ME262 crew tooling along beside us, and all of a sudden he just gave it to power, and away he went. He, they, we couldn't catch him at all. But if we could see him coming, they were no threat to us really, because we could outturn them. But uh, other than that, uh, saw quite a few of them. I'd heard that yeah. one of the favored ways by the American pilots to take out a 262 is the way till they were out of fuel and they were landing and yep. they'd try to come in. And yep. Did you see any of your guys yep. do that sort of thing? Yep. Uh, we had one guy by the name of Urban Drew uh, got two one day and I think both of them were in the landing pattern. Hmm. That's, well, that's war. That's <laughs> right. Know? Got to do what you got to yep. do. But one thing we didn't do, we never tried to shoot any any pilot that had bailed out mm -hmm. and it was in a parachute. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what was your impression of? Uh, now you were a, you were an officer. Yes. What was your impression of your fellow officers and some of the enlisted men and that sort of thing? I mean, well. They come in all descriptions, but I tell you, a lot of the credit for success, for our success, was due to the ground crew. Mm -hmm. Due to the ground crew. Mm -hmm. They were very dedicated in what they were doing. Did you carry bombs on your plane? Did you drop bombs? I never carried one, but we did. The group that was at St. Dizier, they did carry some bombs during that Battle of the Bulge uh, effort. Mm -hmm. And during that time, um, now you, you said you did not, did you fly any missions in support of the Battle of the Bulge that no, was going on? Not one. So, you in fact, I sat on the ground all from about December the Okay, so we're rolling again. You've got uh, you've got your 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 uh, your book of your unit here. This book was put together by Steve Gotts, mm -hmm. uh, an Englishman. He probably worked on this for ten or fifteen years, searching the archives and getting stories, and put this pictorial history of our group together. Uh, it's called Little Friends. And by the way, if you'd like to s take this with you, if you'll bring it back to me, I'll let you uh, let you have this, this sure. one. Sure. I have okay. two. This one, I got a replacement because somehow in the printing, uh, it, got, it got messed up, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. There's some yep. creases there. Yep. Other than that, it's all... Uh, <coughs> so that's your mission log there, right? Yep. And I have uh, highlighted the missions that I flew on. Mm -hmm. And I flew my first... <coughs> excuse me. I flew my first combat mission on November the 29th. And I flew my last mission before the group was split up and part of them went to St. Dizier. I flew that one on December the 12th. I didn't fly another mission until February the 8th. Mm -hmm. So, 
January, <coughs> latter part of December and uh, all of January and first few days of February, I didn't I didn't fly anything. Well, they had me. Uh, I was ferry ferrying some P-51s to other groups <coughs> during that time, and I took the opportunity to fly some of the other kind of aircraft that we had on our our base during that that period of time. I I flew the P-47. Just wanted to check out in it. Gee, that was a big old lumbering thing, but boy, it was a tough old airplane. But mm -hmm. uh, it was not the responsive airplane that the P-51 was. Uh, And it was on Muldorf Field where we lost old Ford. So on most of those missions that you have highlighted there, you said those were predominantly bomber escort missions? Yes, most of them. And it will tell you in here what kind of missions. Target escort, uh, target escort, that meant mm -hmm. escorting bombers. Did you typically escort the same bomber groups? No, not necessarily. Just whoever was available, or you just well, kind of... Whatever came down from higher headquarters said, mm -hmm. hey, this is your group. And you know, of course, because the bombers were much slower than, than the fighters uh, in air airspeed, uh, they usually took off a couple of hours before we did. Because mm -hmm. we'd catch them before mm -hmm. they got to uh, enemy territory. Anyhow, uh oh, and I even have my picture in here. You have a picture there? Yeah. Let's see if put that in front of the camera here. Which one? Right there. And there's the. There's the H. There's the Heinkel there. Oh, well, there's Dwayne right there. Good looking young guy. And then there's the. Uh, the disputed HE-111, but I believe Dwayne, <laughs> uh, I think he, uh... now is that picture taken from gun camera footage? Mm -hmm. Is that from your your plane? Uh, I have no way of knowing. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you something I didn't mention before. When we spotted this Heinkel 111, of course, I flipped on my, my gun sight. No gun sight didn't light up. And so what hits I got on that thing, and I got a lot of them, I did by watching the tracers as I was coming in. It was a deflection shot. What, so can I, you describe a deflection shot? How, yeah, how's that work? We, we probably were coming in at about a 45 degree angle, mm -hmm. and he's, he's going along here, and we're we're coming in this way. So the, the Heinkel was moving? Yes. It oh, wasn't yeah. a stationary target? No, no, no. He was flying along pretty close to the deck. Ah, okay. Uh, and we spotted him. And after he bellied that thing in, though, after our first pass, we came back around. Three people jumped out of that thing and ran into a culvert. <laughs> there was a... So, uh, but anyhow, my hits were done with out benefit of my gun sight that day. Oh, I was sick. And sound like you did okay. You probably wouldn't yeah. have done much better with your gun sight, huh? Might not. <laughs> might not have. Well, that's fascinating. Um, how um, did you did you make? I'm sure you made a lot of friends. You know, some of the guys over there. You keep in touch with them. Oh still? yes, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I. I email with one, two, three, and one who won't, uh, doesn't have a, a computer, but uh, 
two of them are going to be at the reunion this year. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Chandler, and he stayed in the service and uh, retired as a colonel. And Walter Hedges, who also graduated when I did, uh, stayed in and he uh, retired as a colonel. So I'm kind of outranked by my my fellow <laughs> graduates. <laughs> well, you know, looking back on your experiences as a fighter pilot and, you know, when with World War II, how did that, did that impact your life at all? Did that change the way you looked at things? Yes, absolutely. You know, I learned something about discipline while I was in the service. And uh, my dad was a Marine in World War I. And on his discharge, it has all of the battles he participated in. And there were five of them. And there were five that I studied about when I was a kid in history. So, but funny, my dad never wanted any of his boys to go into the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So I went into the Air Force, and I had three brothers, and they all went into the Navy. So, we're not super patriots or anything. But I think I come from a family who did its duty, mm -hmm. did its duty. Mm -hmm. And I tried to tell my grandkids, your granddad was no hero, but I did what I thought I sh should do. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, that's great. Um, well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, you know, in closing, what I wouldn't mind, would mind doing is we still have about about 20 minutes left. What we could do is get your photo album out and okay. maybe position the camera so we could just have you thumb through your photo album, maybe talk about guys that you have in there and okay. so on. Pilots. So, okay. So Gathered for a... So this is, this is the 376th Fighter Squadron. Yes. And can you again point out where you're at in this picture? I'm right there. Look at that fellow right there. Yep. It's like you got your hat cocked a little bit more than everybody else there. <laughs> oh, really? I wouldn't be surprised. And that was Jay Ruck. He was my flight commander at that time. Yeah. He was not the German ace. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. The airplanes wow. taken in formations. and. That's great. So now these were all, were these taken by you? No, no. Okay. No, they were just pictures that I acquired. Wow. Boy, the, this has lost its stickiness. Got a lot of great photos. What's the story behind now this? Now that's an old P-40. That was taken. At, that picture was taken at Waycross, Georgia. Okay. And is your signature on here? Well, yeah, there I am, right back there. <laughs> so it says Lieutenant Ground's taking advantage of the short English summer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you overslept one day, you might miss summer. <laughs> And that picture down there was taken, uh, well, it tells, I think. Lieutenant Grounds after landing at Belfast, Northern Ireland for R&R. Yep. So that you take your plane with you whenever you go yep. to R&R. That's nice. Yep. Probably was a war-weary one. Mm. Another P-40? Another P-40. 
but I'm not in. That's a different uh, different group. Some buddies there. Yeah, this Bart was Bartine George. Bless his heart, he died of Alzheimer's when he was in his fifties. Oh boy, boy, what a smart guy he was too. He was all army. I mean. He, he couldn't understand some of us who were less military than he. He was real military, and that's him again. This is a picture of a Czechoslovakian who was in the RAF, and they brought uh, a squadron of Spitfires piloted by these guys mm -hmm. to come over and play combat with us because the Spitfire had a lot of the same characteristics as the Jap Zero. Mm -hmm. Well, these guys were crazy. They'd line up on the runway out there like eight deep, and when the first man gave it the gun, the last man gave it the gun, and all of them were in the prop wash except the one leading. But they were, they could fly. Wow. They could fly. Another group of guys there. That's another P-40. Now these... At Waycross. Are, those are at Waycross. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. Let's see Robert Hobbs. Yeah. He died of cancer here mm -hmm. about four or five years ago. He was, I guess, my best buddy. Mm -hmm. He and I were... So that's you there yep. in England. Yep. <laughs> and here is the chateau where we... Uh, we lived. Wow, that's pretty there nice. There wasn't a stick of furniture in that place, but we we lived in there and slept on uh, uh, army cots. Mm. But it was pretty nice. Waiting for fighters to return. <laughs> and that was uh, Colonel Christensen. Uh, the CO who was shot down. He was a West Pointer. Wow. And, but he was shot down in August. B-17 there? Mm-hmm. That's that same picture that oh, I showed you okay. before. And this is the same picture. Seems like a mouse got a hold of that one. Oops. Losing the pictures here. Yeah. Currency exchange. <laughs> That's you had to have. <laughs> That's another picture. Are these all reunion photos here? These are reunion photos, uh huh. <laughs> show you a picture of my wife. She was a really delightful lady who touched a lot more lives than I ever realized. <laughs> that airplane there mm -hmm. named Miss Torque mm -hmm. It was owned by a fellow by the name of Satterfield. He was a colonel in the in the Confederate Air Force, mm -hmm. and he uh, had taken the the uh, fuselage tank out of it and put a little jump seat in there. And I went for a ride with him. Oh wow! And what we were doing was uh, we were having a reunion in Houston, and. Uh, we were going to do a flyover with a P-51, a, a P-47, and a, a, a Navy Wildcat. Mm -hmm. Well, we went up and flew around for, for quite a while, and the other two didn't ever show up. So Satterfield says, would you like to do some aerobatics? And I said, go ahead. And shoot, I couldn't carry his shoes. <laughs> I thought I could do acrobatics, but he was absolutely the smoothest acrobatic pilot 
I ever, ever saw. <coughs> and bless his heart, about three years later, he died of brain cancer. Oh, boy. Yeah. Mm. And you can see the PR man at, at our <coughs> base got ahead of the, of the official mm -hmm. giving me some credit there, and then they took it away. That's amazing. And there's, there was Satterfield's card. Wow. Yep. That's, that's me there. And is that a Mustang there? Yep. Okay. Yep. You can tell the four blades. Yep. <coughs> it was Van den Heuvel and he died and he passed away in England mm. here oh four or five years ago. Oh, those are all kinds of pictures of us hot pilots sitting in a. In a <laughs> is P that still one torque? Is I that... think so. Yes. <laughs> yep. Well, I got a lot of pictures of Miss Torque. Uh, my nose is running. On, she's gone. Mm. He's gone. That's Bernie Dennehy. His grandson beat him to death over in Oklahoma City. Oh my gosh. You may... How long have you been back in Tulsa? Since October 2005. <laughs> yeah, like